Our featured speakers today are Frank Viscatis, co-author of Customer-Centric Selling, and Steve Tran, sales manager at Envia. Frank and Steve will be sharing tips with you on how to develop a more proactive sales strategy using the customer-centric selling methodology and getting early. Throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat box. We'll collect these questions and answer them in order during our Q&A session. Frank Viscatis brings 20 years of leadership experience and is the author of Customer Centric Selling. He's also the co-founder and president of Customer Centric System and has personally trained thousands of sales professionals around the world. On the slide, you can see just a sample of the companies he's worked with. Welcome, Frank. We're very excited to have such a quality speaker like you to join us today. Later in the session, you will also hear from Steve Tran, who's the sales manager here at Anvia. Steve has been leading a team of sales executives who are responsible for helping our clients and contract to find contract opportunities and win in the government space. His success equation is an agency-focused strategy and solution selling. So welcome to you, Steve, as well. Now you have a little more background about our speakers today. We will kick off today's webinar. Frank, I'll turn it to, to you. Thank you, Melody. If you could put up the next slide. Before I go into our specific strategies and tactics as it relates to RFPs and specifically unsolicited RFPs, I wanted to give you some background on how buyers buy and where RFPs fit into the process. The chart that you see in front of you is a chart that documents research that's been done over the last 30 to 35 years about how buyers buy complex, expensive, intangible products and services. And what we've done is we've broken the buying cycle down into three distinct phases. Phase one is what we call the solution development phase. Phase two is the evaluation phase. And phase three is the commitment phase. Now, 10 to 15 years ago, before the internet really took off and, and the wealth of information was put forth into the marketplace that exists now, in many cases, salespeople were able to initiate this buying cycle with a buyer. In other words, they were help, able to help buyers recognize a new need that they might have, work with them through this solution development phase, helping them see a vision of the capabilities that they might need moving forward, segueing into an evaluation phase where due diligence was done, demonstrations, validation, etc. With the RFP actually being issued relatively late in the process, usually mid to, to most of the way through that, RF, uh, that second phase of the buying cycle. And in many cases, RFPs are part of a company's buying process, especially when you deal with a larger organization, or as Steve will talk about later on in the webinar, when you're dealing with large government uh, purchases or large government acquisitions, the RFPs are mandatory. The question becomes, did the salesperson who is contacted and sent the RFP have any ability to influence that RFP, or is when that RFP shows up on their desk the first time they're finding out about it? If you, you look back to that beginning of the buying cycle, it's a triggering event that takes place that causes the buying cycle to start, the recognition of a need on the part of the buyer. Now, as I said, 10 to 15 years ago, Salespeople typically were able, in many cases, to help buyers initiate that process. However, as I also mentioned, with the explosion of information in the marketplace and the wealth of information in the marketplace, that whole dynamic has changed. And what we found and we are finding is that buyers in today's buying environment, whether they be in the commercial space or in the government space, are really taking themselves through at least the first phase, and in many cases, the second phase of the buying cycle. In other words, they're creating the vision on their own by accessing the information that's out there and available to them prior to ever issuing the RFP. And when the RFP shows up on that salesperson's desk, it's just what I call the shadow of the story. And what I mean by the shadow of the story is this. In many cases, the RFP documents what the requirements are, but it never goes into what are the real business drivers what caused that RFP to be issued in the first place? In fact, I was working with a client of mine out in Minneapolis a couple of years ago, and I asked the salespeople to share some difficulties with me that they were experiencing. And one of the difficulties that one of the salespeople shared with me 
is he said, Frank, when, uh, when I get in, uh, my cell cycle starts when I get an RFP. And the reality of the situation is his cell cycle was over when he got that RFP because he didn't have the ability to influence it. And as I'll talk about in a couple of slides, simply responding to that RFP and hoping for the best is really a losing proposition. Next slide. In fact, there was a research report done by Genius.com called Breaking Out of the Funnel that documented that in today's environment, <clears throat> buyers are educating themselves prior to ever engaging with vendors. In fact, as you see some of the statistics in front of you, 59% of buyers engaged with a peer first who had addressed a specific challenge. They're leveraging social networking, LinkedIn, etc. Almost half follow industry blogs on, on a specific topic. 44% conduct anonymous research on a short list of vendors. In fact, in many cases, when we talk about the short list of vendors, salespeople are being eliminated from opportunities before they even knew that they were ever involved in them. 41% follow those industry thought leaders, 37% post questions via social networking, and 20% use social networking to reach out directly to those vendors. The numbers don't add up to 100% because most buyers are going to engage in multiples of these activities. But the important thing for salespeople and for selling organizations to recognize is that buyers are going through a self-education process. They're getting there on their own. And if you as a salesperson, if you as a selling organization, don't have the ability to influence that process, again, simply responding is a losing proposition. Next slide. In fact, what I want to do is I want to share a story with you about an online travel management company that I've been working with for the last seven years. About two years ago, they had a new executive team put in place, and that executive team, against the, the advice of their sales management and their account management team, began responding to every RFP that was issued that they became part of. In fact, there were often very large RFPs, some of them in the millions of dollars. And it was becoming very frustrating for the VP of sales and the account management team because these were the people responsible for formulating the responses to the RFPs. I went out and met with them last fall and we did a study of what it was costing them, what was the cost benefit of simply responding to an unsolicited RFP. And what we found when we dug into their CRM system was that over the course of the prior 12 months, they had spent the equivalent of $1.1 million dollars to respond to unsolicited RFPs that had simply landed on their desk. In fact, what it broke down to was approximately $35,000 per response. Now, that may seem or sound like a big number to some of you, but if you think about it, when you have to respond to an RFP, it's rarely, if ever, just one person responding to it. There's multiple people from your organization that have to be involved in that process. And in many cases, that doesn't even take into account the opportunity cost. What other opportunities did we miss by wasting our time on this unsolicited RFP? And what this particular organization found was that that, that investment of $1.1 million resulted $175,000 in revenue. It's the old joke about how we lose money on every deal, but we make it up in volume. So if you could go to the next slide. What we recommend in customer-centric selling and what I revisited with this particular client was a particular strategy designed specifically for handling unsolicited bids and unsolicited RFPs. Our recommendation is this. The next time you receive an unsolicited RFP, contact whoever sent it to you, whether it was procurement, an industry consultant, whomever the case may be, and offer to complete that RFP if what they will first do is provide you access to key executives of the job titles of your choosing so that you can interview them to find out what were the business drivers that caused that RFP to be generated. Now, recognize in the public sector and the regulated marketplace, once the RFP is issued, that's really not an option. There's le legal issues around it, laws surrounding who can be contacted, when they can be contacted. However, in the regulated environment, what you can usually do is ask for a bidder's conference. And our suggestion is that just as if you would get access to executives in a commercial environment, if you can get to a bidder's conference, whatever agency has issued that RFP typically has to have someone there who can respond uh, and answer questions. So you have to do the, the process 
of trying to uncover what the business drivers is are, I'm sorry, are in more of a public venue as opposed to one-on-one -on -one exchanges. Now, here's the challenge for us as salespeople in selling organizations. If they won't give you that access, should you spend your time responding? Well, I guess I would ask the question, can you make your quota losing 98.4% of the time? I know I can't. Now, there are some dirty little secrets, though, in the RFP business that if you're aware of them, you can use them to your advantage. And the first and maybe the biggest one is this. In many cases, they need you to respond, whether it's because their buying process requires that they secure a certain number of bids, or if you happen to be in the fortunate position where you're a leader in your particular space, if you don't respond to that RFP, it can invalidate the entire process. So sometimes you can use that leverage, their need for you to respond to gain that access, whether it's direct access or through that bidders conference. Now, again, I try to avoid the words always and never because they tend to get me in trouble. Sometimes you might want to respond to an unsolicited RFP just to learn about their buying process, build goodwill, etc. But recognize that if you can't get that access, your chances of success are very low. Now, that client I mentioned a couple of minutes ago who had spent $1.1 million securing $175,000 in revenue, I went back to them and asked them this question. When you did influence the RFP, whether you were the vendor that caused them to issue it or even after it was issued, if you could get access and if you could kind of recreate or re-engineer that vision with them, what was your success rate in that case? Next slide. And they found that their success rate went from 1.6% to 38%. And the key was gaining access to those executives, gaining access to uncover what the underlying business drivers are, rather than just blindly responding. Next slide. So just to wrap up my portion of this, I'd like to share with you a couple of core concepts from the customer-centric selling methodology. The first is this. People buy from people who are sincere and competent and who empower them to see a vision of how they can achieve their business goals, solve their problems, and satisfy their needs. No one buys based on demos, brochures, or responses to proposals. The second core concept is that bad news early is good news. When you ask for that access, if you're denied the access, our recommendation is that you walk from the opportunity. If you're going to spend 30 or 60 days responding to an RFP that you're going to lose anyway, I'd rather find that out now than wait the 30 to 60 days just to find out exactly the same thing. The key is understanding the triggering events that caused that RFP to be issued, being able to do research and really understand who it is that you're dealing with, and be able to build a relationship versus just filling out an RFP. So Steve, I'll transition over to you. Thank you, Frank. So the reality of pursuing government business is that you have to get in early. In order to understand the importance, let's first talk about how government purchases are made. The government today purchases mainly in three ways, through micro purchases, informal purchases, and formal purchases. And I'll take a moment to go over these three types. Micro purchases. These are purchases typically equal to or less than $2,500. The government relies solely on the judgment of the contracting officer to decide what is best for that agency. At that point, the contracting officer can use a resource such as a vendor's list or the web to find their vendor of choice and make a purchase on the spot using a credit card. The second is an informal or acquisition purchase. These are purchases equal to or less than $100,000. The agency and contracting officer are typically required to document that they attain three quotes. They can use their formula after attaining the three quotes as to decide as to which vendor they would like to choose. The third um, is the formal or the RFP. Now, that's the final 20%. Today, about 80% of the government spending is done using the first two avenues. Both the micro purchase and informal purchase are not required to be advertised to the public. These are left to the discretion of the agency to find a vendor when they have a need. So the final 20% that we're speaking of, or the RFPs, are the formal purchasing, 
And these give all members of the public an opportunity to go after as they're publicly advertised. There are typically is a set time and date when they're due and a set time and date for them to be opened. Now, let's refer back to Frank's slide earlier where he discussed the buyer's vision and the buyer's development of needs. Now, per, per Frank's slide in the survey from Genius.com, 59% of the time the buyer has engaged a peer who has faced the same challenge. 44% of the time, that buyer has conducted an anonymous research of vendors to the solutions to their problems. So when you combine this data, of the final 20% of government business that goes out from public advertisement, 50% of the time, these individuals already have a bias towards another solution through their own education. So the reality is, get in early. Get in early so that you can be at top of mind when they are purchasing at the micro level or at the informal acquisition level. If it's for a formal purchase, you want to get in early so that you can be there during phase one of their buying cycle when they're evaluating their needs and potential solutions. Getting in early is so critical to the building of correct relationships with partners so that you can fill, fulfill the gaps in the buyer's needs. Now, before we move on, I'd like to share with you guys a brief story uh, about getting in early. Sometime back, we were approached by a school yearbook publisher. Every year, they were going after between 200 and 300 RFPs. So as you can imagine, how many school districts are in your state, multiply that by 50, and you can start seeing why every single employee, every single day, had their full hands on deck putting out RFPs on time. Their biggest challenge when we met with them was, one, how can we increase our win ratios? And two, how can we decrease the cost of putting out so many bids on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis? So the first question we asked them was, well, are you getting in early enough? Their immediate response was, well, Steve, of course we're getting in early. We know typically about bids the day they come out, and sometimes we even know about them four or five weeks before they're put out for bid or RFP. But the truth is, Steve, when we speak to them four or five weeks before, they tell us that it's illegal for them to give us any additional information as they're in the middle of putting together the specs, so they cannot give us any sort of competitive advantage at that point. After hearing this, I guess we agreed that, of course, knowing about a bid or RFP four or five weeks before would not make an impact or change the way that they were doing business today, and it would not increase their win ratios or decrease the, curse in, decrease the cost they were incurring putting out bids and RFPs. So at this point, we took a step back and we decided to study their business and their buyers. And there were two major things that came to light. One, many of these school yearbook contracts were anywhere from two to four year contracts. So even though one of their competing incumbents might have won it this year, this would be available to win again within the next couple of years. Two, the second item we learned is the school districts and principals were not making their decisions four to five weeks before they put out the RFP, but their decision was actually happening in year one of the current incumbent's contract. Once the, of course, first yearbook publication was released, they were immediately receiving feedback from the faculty and the student body about what they wanted from their next vendor. So, they knew about this many years in advance as to what they would want their specs to look like in the future. So, after discussing these two points, we were able to confirm a strategy to help this yearbook publisher complete their two objectives. Our agreed upon strategy was this. Map out what school districts would be coming up for rebid in the next six to 24 months from now. By looking back at who won in 2010 and in 2011, we were able to create a runway or roadmap of future opportunities. What this publisher did with this roadmap was they essentially scheduled all the, they scheduled meetings with all the school districts, the faculty and student body that were six months to 24 months out. And what they wanted to do was understand their likes and dislikes about the current yearbook they had in hand. If it was positive and it looked like the school district liked what they, would, they received, and would want to continue the publisher's format, they then it would be a no-go decision, and they would not go after the bid or RFP during the following year. 
Now, if the faculty and students' response during the meeting was negative to their current yearbook, then they would spend an additional hour, as Frank had mentioned earlier, interviewing to understand how to enhance the solution to fit the needs of the school district in the following year. Now using the strategy, they now knew what RFPs they didn't have to go after next year based off the positive responses, decreasing the number of RFPs they put out, leading to that overall decrease in annual cost. Two, they knew based off the, company, the, the school districts that were unhappy and would be more likely to change, they could interview them early enough and could now include in their RFP the, of course, enhanced solutions to increase their win ratios. I share this because getting an early for every company is so different. For this company, getting an early meant helping them understand what was happening 6 to 24 months from now. That was a huge change in focus for them, as prior they were, hap they were focused on what was happening in the next 30 to 60 days. A lot of companies do this all the time. They focus on today because they believe that if they don't go after all the RFPs that are in front of them today, it's missed revenue. So they keep in this constant cycle of working hard with their heads down, doing the same process over and over. I challenge each of you today to take a step back, look at where there might be an opportunity to get in earlier, because in many cases, in many cases, the cost of doing things the same way outweighs the cost of changing as it did for this school yearbook publisher. Next slide. So, how to win before a public solicitation? Introductions that will trigger a change. I believe at one time or another, all of us in this room have been approached by a salesperson who, who knew little or nothing about us, but certainly knew everything about their own product or service. And within a measly five minutes, I'm sure they wanted to teach us everything in hopes that it would trigger in us to make a change in their favor. I think I can answer for most of us that it probably did not trigger a change in their favor for their product or service. Similarly, government agencies go through the same experience with vendors as we do with salespeople. Frank's customer-centric selling is what we recommend and it helps so many sales organizations because it helps us think as salespeople how to think about the customer's challenges and look at the customer's problems through their lens. To help illustrate how well aligned Frank's customer-centric selling methodology is to selling to the government, I'd like to share with you a story one of our trainers had while meeting with a uh, government purchasing agent. We wanted to learn what makes purchasing agents buy and not buy. One particular buyer I'm going to discuss was from a large metropolitan airport authority, which, which he was, of course, in charge of the facilities. And we asked him two questions. One, give us an experience of what salespeople do that stops you from listening. Two, give us an example of a time where someone was able to trigger you to make a change. He states, well, here at the airports, we constantly get calls and requests from salespeople to meet about our building control systems. Now, for those of you who don't know, building control systems, they manage the power and the environment of the building, from the heating, the air conditioning, uh, the boilers, um, even sometimes the escalators and elevators, as a matter of fact. So as you can imagine, it's a fairly complex and sophisticated system to maintain, uh, which means it's a pretty expensive ticket item. And he had said over the years, he had met with a large number of manufacturers who did building control systems. Some flew in one sales rep, some flew in two. Some even bought, brought in multiple sales reps from the same company if the first meeting was not successful. But he said no matter the company, no matter the rep, all approached their meetings with him the same way, which was, hi, my name is, and you know what? I've been looking at your airport for quite some time and I would like to consult you on how my company's building control system is the best. Ours can do this, ours can do that, and as well, ours can do this too. And he said within five minutes, he turned his ears off because he had heard so many eyes, ours, our can, ours will, and nothing about the conversation was about him, his challenges, his obstacles, his needs. So in response, we said, I guess over the years, you've never changed your building control and building automation systems. He said, well, no. 
He said there was one individual who was unique from all the others that finally triggered him to make a change. The vendor, the way that he approached him was, Hi Joe, in 2002 I found that your airport purchased an XYZ building automation system. I'll use XYZ here to protect the vendor. And he followed that up with, in your state, the 2015 energy standards require that you reduce your energy consumption by 15%. And from what I read from your county CIPs, its top initiative is to reduce the use of fossil fuels and become more sustainable. Currently, I see that you're about 7% short of the state's energy standard. And based off your budget documents, it doesn't look like you can afford any new expenses this year. Well, what I'd like to discuss with you is how our building automation system can help you cover the 7% gap in energy use while using the monthly energy savings to pay for the cost so that you don't have to ask the county for additional budget. Now this approach, it beat out all the other building control system vendors that had spent time, money, and resources trying to trigger, trigger a change in the airport's building control systems. The other companies got in early, and yes, they got in early enough to trigger a change, but they didn't have the approach that it took to trigger the change. This is why Frank's customer-centric selling methodology is so important. His approach shares with you the mindset, the preparation, and the information you need to have in order to not just sell to the government, but to sell to any of your customers. And what I hear most uh, when I share this <clears throat> with sales organizations is that, well, Steve, gathering this intelligence takes a long time and we don't have the time to do it. Well, it's really expensive to acquire, Steve. And one of the best I've heard is, well, yes, that looks like it'll work, but you know, we're working on a project right now and we'll push that off till later. My response to these organizations when I hear that is, once again, the cost of you doing things the same way will outweigh your cost of change. Make the investment in your organization. Give your marketing, give your sales, give your business development teams the tools so that they can be knowledgeable about your customers and create introductions that are incredibly meaningful. Similar to the yearbook publisher, their win ratios of these building control manufacturers can be quite low and their cost of acquisition through travel can be quite high. They also need to make an investment in themselves if they want to see better results. So if you want to win before an RFP, you got to build the right relationships. This seems to be a term that we hear over and over, yet as organizations, we constantly miss the apex as to who we're supposed to speak with. In order to build the right relationships, think about where your service or product lands in relation to the three types of government purchasing I mentioned earlier. The micro-purchasing, purchases under 2,500. Informal purchases, purchases under or equal to 100,000. And formal purchases, purchases equal to or greater than 100,000. First, understand where your purchases fall. Then understand not just who does the purchasing, but who sways a decision for purchase as they are often very different. Here in Seattle, over the past few years, we've added a number of painted bicycle lanes. And although it seems as though painting a street line or a bicycle symbol on the street would mean meeting with somebody at the informal or micro-purchasing level, believe it or not, the person who helped drive this initiative for more painted bicycle lanes in Seattle was the mayor. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, seismic building testing, or the testing of our city's buildings to see how well it will sustain an earthquake, one would think that due to the significance of its failure that this would be treated on the formal purchasing level. However, many cities leave it to the building engineer's hands to determine the best contractor. So it's often done at the micro or informal level. So don't just build more relationships, but build them with the right buyers of your services. And remember, the cost of doing things the same way can often outweigh the cost of change. In conclusion, through our experience, surveys, and the stories that we shared with you today, I hope that you take away three things. One, the reality of doing government business is that you have to get in early. Take the time to understand what is early for your organization. Two, if you want to trigger a change in your favor, 
you must look through the lens of your customer. And three, understand where your products and services fall in the purchasing windows. Melody, I believe Frank and I are available for Q&A. Thank you, Steve. And just a reminder, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, put it in the chat box. Um, throughout the session, we have collected a series of, uh, series of questions, and we'll get that started and queued for Frank and Steve uh, in just a second. Before I get started with the Q&A session, I want to remind everyone that the webinar today is recorded and will be sent to all the registrants and attendees. So rest assured, you will get this copy. Um, so the first question uh, I got was from, uh, was for Frank, and then it's about improving the chance to win. So the question reads, if I do get access and I therefore I have to respond to a bid or a P, do, I, do you have any additional recommendations that might help my chances? Frank? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, our recommendation yeah. is that if you do get access, whether it's to individual buyers or to the buying committee, that in addition to just the responses to the questions within the RFP, take the time to write a two or three page executive summary that ideally outlines your understanding of what the business drivers are that you were able to uncover, and additionally highlighting any unique capabilities that you might have been able to insert into their vision. And the reason we suggest writing the executive summary is that, that my experience is that there's only two parts of an RFP response that executives really read. That's the executive summary and the price. All the stuff in the middle is generally for lower level people to pour through. Great. Um, and then my next question is about price. So uh, one, uh, one question says, you know, I, I'm... Uh, my business is a commodity service, so it's hard to differentiate other than price. Uh, what what should I do in terms of you know lowballing my uh, my price to win the business? Well, I mean, certainly a couple of things to think about. One is um, if you are in a commodity type of sale, uh, our belief is that you can differentiate yourself as much by the way you sell as by what you sell. And in a, in a commodity type sale especially, using your interaction with the buyer and how you engage with them, uh, again, using tools like Envia to, to make sure you've done the research, to build the relationships, et cetera, using those uh, as competitive differentiators rather than just trying to differentiate on price. The danger in just lowballing a price in order to get the business is that in many cases, uh, there are other safety valves, if you will, built into the whole process. Let me give you a quick example. I have a friend of mine who does human resources consulting, and about 10 or, well, probably more like 15 years ago, uh, he bid on a piece of business via an RFP uh, to do about a quarter of a million dollar project with Con Edison in New York. And he did just that. He lowballed the price, ended up being awarded the business because he did have the lowest price, but he got about two weeks into the engagement and found out that at any time during the process, the company, the client, had the ability to pull the plug and go with someone else if they weren't, quote unquote, satisfied with the results. And sure enough, uh, they had a bias toward another consultant that they wanted to work with. The person I knew got the business initially because he lowballed it, but ultimately after two weeks, it got pulled and, and given to the other vendor. And Thanks, Frank. Um, the next question, I think, uh, is uh, it could be both for Frank or Steve, um, but it reads, what is the best approach towards effort estimate for an RFP or an RFI? I'm sorry, could you repeat that one more time? What is the best? What's the best effort estimate? So, you know, how do I kind of gauge the amount of work or the amount of effort that my sales team will have to put towards responding to um, RF RFP or RFP? RFQ. Steve, do you want to comment on that or would you like me to? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I believe we probably could both. Um, a couple of things. In terms of, you know, I, I most recently went to... Uh, a uh, seminar here down in San Francisco and they surveyed the room <clears throat> and they surveyed the room of how many people will have put together 100 page RFPs, 200 page RFPs, 300 pages, 
all the way up to 500 pages. And even at 500 pages, a number of hands in the room were still up in the air. Um, some of the things that I could recommend uh, to, to help you understand the effort are take a look at if that agency has put out a similar RFP in the past three to five years. Um, oftentimes, you can put together a FOIA request to take a look at the winning RFP, winning proposals, um, and take a look at what the previous incumbent had to do to win. That might give you a good judge or indicator as what it would take for you. You know, I think also it comes back to, to the fundamental message behind this webinar itself is that it, it's all, I think it's a very binary decision as to whether you can get access or not. And if you, if you can't get any access, if you can't influence the process, I wouldn't want to fill out a 100-page, never mind a 500-page RFP response if I've had no ability to impact or influence that process. Now, Steve made a comment earlier on during his portion of the presentation uh, where he mentioned, he referred back to the research that I had shown you uh, by Genius.com, and he pointed out that 50% of the time, the buyer already has a bias towards someone else. Well, let's take a, a best-case scenario. Let's say that because you've got a great marketing department, you've got great presence in the marketplace, even if they have a bias toward you when they issue the RFP, in many cases, if you're not able to influence or participate in that process, you're unable to establish real value as it, at a business level as it relates to what it is that you offer. And without value, if it comes time to negotiate, there's only one variable you can negotiate on, and that's price. So even if they have a bias toward you, developing that relationship and nurturing that relationship and really understanding the business drivers is the absolute key. Great. Thanks, Frank. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions about, um, you know, uh, the concept that Steve talked about, about micro purchases as well as informal purchases. So how do you get on the vendor list and effectively build relationships to win more uh, on advertised purchasing? Steve? Could you repeat that question one more time, Melody? Yep. So how do you win more business through the informal and micro purchase level? Yeah, I think um, two things. Um, the first, I would recommend getting registered on the agency's vendors list for those agencies that you would like to work with. Um, imagine the vendors list as being a sort of yellow pages for the government agencies to use. Now, just because you're on the vendors list, it does not mean that they have to use it for all purchases or that they will contact you for all informal purchases, uh, but it is an opportunity to have them reach on out to you. Um, a second and maybe a more strategic approach um, would be to take a look at who is spending the most on major trigger events for you um, because that will typically trickle down dollars to the micro-purchasing um, and smaller events. So let me, um, an example that I would give to you is, let's say you're a landscape contractor. Um, if I was a landscape contracting company in business development and I wanted to win more micro and informal purchasing contracts, I take a look at what cities and counties are engaging in the most um, RFP for roadway resurfacing or roadway reconstruction work because this typically leads to much smaller landscape projects around those roads that they resurface at the micro and informal purchasing level. Thanks, Steve. Um, so I think this question is for both Frank and Steve, and it's about the concept of getting early. Um, how, do, how do we get to know about upcoming bids or RFPs that are you know, 6 to 24 months in advance? Well, I think that, that what you have to be doing, uh, from our perspective anyways, is constantly monitoring your prospect base for what we call triggering events. In other words, what is it that's going to cause them to begin to look to change? Uh, in the commercial world, it can be things like mergers and acquisitions. In the, in the more regulated world, it could be new laws, new regulatory issues, etc. But in many cases there's something that's going to cause someone or cause an organization to be ready to begin this process. And the key is, can I, can I be with them from the start or as close to the start as possible? And really that only can happen if you're actively looking for that and nurturing them along the way. And the example I often give when I'm teaching a workshop is that uh, for my organization, uh, a, a small transaction 
is twenty or thirty thousand dollars a large transaction goes into the multi millions, and whether it's a thirty thousand dollar transaction or a two million dollar transaction, our average sell cycle is about sixty days. Now, sometimes it takes a company five years to be ready for that sixty day sell cycle, but once they're ready, things move along pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, to follow that, to follow Frank's statement up. Um, uh, on more of a research approach, if you want to take a look at what's happening six to 24 months from now, uh, another recommendation that I would make is uh, you can visit your city and state or local county offices. Uh, a majority have capital improvement plans and budget documents that will share with you not just this year's plan to see what's happening six months from now, but future plans. Um, and if you've ever studied a CIP or these budget documents that the city carries, you often see that they'll list what their top three, five, seven objectives are for the year, and they'll even list out year by year what projects they plan on undertaking and the amount they plan on setting aside to do so. Um, if you do work with the government, I mean, this is some of the best intelligence that you can have uh, because it tells you dollars, plans, goals, as well as even barriers to action um, to make you a well-informed, of course, seller of your product or service. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, if you're in, if time is uh, very short for your company, um, there are private companies like he, us here at Onvia, and I mean we have a library of the budgets and CIPs, and we actually help extract only those CIPs and plans that matter to you. Um, so similar to that story I shared earlier about the years, the school yearbook publisher, um, if you focus on more than one state and you can start imagining how overwhelming it can be to capture all the CIPs. A uh, private company like Onvia can definitely do some of that research work for you. Steve, to follow up on that question, um, actually one another additional question about this is um, a construction uh, client, and then he says, construction cycle is vastly different from an immediate sale. Our company is truly interested in the pre-design phase. How does Onvia find construction projects versus a Dodge report company? So that's kind of, uh, feeding into what you were saying about the spending, do you think this will be a good case to use the spending plans and capital improvements yeah. uh, documents to? I actually, uh, most recently I was looking at a capital improvement plan, so well, the first answer, yes. Um, most recently I was looking at a capital improvement plan that was sharing uh, literally even the photo of the location and all the, for example, fire stations that in Pennsylvania that needed additions or renovations done over the next three years. It showed which one of those had adopted a budget, how much that budget was, how much of that budget was set aside for the engineering and land development and land study. Um, so for a construction company, um, being that I, I've worked with construction companies in business development, being able to see 12 months from now who needs additions, renovations, how much they're gonna spend, and how much they're setting aside for the engineering was incredible. Um, so if you have the resources and the team to take a look at that and study it and evaluate it, it's definitely useful. Um, I'm getting a lot of kind of industry specific questions, but I think this is a good one to answer. So it reads, the company I worked with is a manufacturer, so we don't actually sell directly to the end user, we sell to contractors. So how do we influence the end user to spec our products and to utilize our products on their projects? Well, I think that if you want your products spec'd in, um, you have to understand, once again, uh, I hate to point back to this so many times, but customer-centric selling is so important. Um, and if, if you can study an agency's top five or seven objectives, and one of your products is, let's say, a tool, a product, or a service that decreases the energy cost for a government agency or saves them money, and one of their top three objectives this year is to decrease their cost, you have a great opportunity to present your products and services to the agency, who then, of course, can spec that into their building, which means that they're the general contractor that they hire they could specifically ask that general contractor to use your product because your product is one that will, of course, help them with one of their top three, five, or seven initiatives this year. That way, it requires not just 
one contractor, but any one of the incumbents who wins to use your contract. Okay, um, we're kind of running out of time and I'm still getting a lot of questions, but we have time for uh, one last question. Um, so the question um, is, uh, let me pick one that could both, that Steve, that both Steve and Frank can speak to. Um, okay, so this question reads, I work in a field where the rates are usually already set prior to the bid. So how would you suggest that I position the executive summary if there's no mention of price? Uh, again, I, I think that the, the whole purpose of the executive summary is to link back your response to what their needs are, uh, not necessarily what, what the price is. And as I mentioned earlier on, uh, you know, I, I call the RFP a shadow of the story because it, while it usually documents requirements, it usually does not document what the real drivers are behind the, the process. And if you can be the salesperson or the vendor that gets in there and engages with them, develops the relationship, and really understands what it is they're trying to accomplish by acquiring whatever it is they're looking to acquire via the RFP process, that you can use that as, as a big competitive differentiator for you. The fact that you are you are really focused on truly understanding their needs, not just filling out what their requirements are. All right, thank you, Frank. Um, I think that concludes our Q&A session. Um, you know, we try to answer as many questions as time allows, but we're running out of time. So if you have any additional questions, concerns, uh, you can feel free to contact either Steve or Frank. Uh, their contact information is on the screen. And again, the webinar is recorded, so everyone will receive a copy of the, re uh, the recording as well as the slides. Um, I, I want to thank everybody for taking out uh, some time to join us today, and then we look forward to uh, having you joining us in our future webinars. Thank you.